Chapter 23, it's about the urinary system. The urinary system has several functions, like removal of the waste products from our blood. Also, it helps regulate the blood volume, the blood pressure, the concentration of hydrogen ions or acid-base balance, also known as pH, and the conservation of electrolytes and nutrients. This is our first key point. Some of the nitrogenous wastes that we have are coming from degradation of the proteins, like in the case of urea. Also, uric acid, which happens by the degradation of nucleic acids, like DNA. Creatinine, which is the degradation product of creatinine phosphate. And specifically for urea. So in urea, you transform proteins into amino acids, and then you remove the NH group, and then you form ammonia. And this ammonia is going to be converted into a less toxic product, which is urea. But this conversion of ammonia into urea will be made by the liver. So this is another key point. Now, uh, measuring urea in our blood, it is known as BUN or blood urea nitrogen. And the normal concentration of blood urea is between 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter of blood. And when someone has elevated bun or azotemia, it may be because the person has kidney failure. And another problem that it can happen is when someone has this uh, elevated urea, but not as elevated as azotemia, it is called uremia. In this case, a person will have accumulation of urea in its body and it will be manifested by having diarrhea, vomiting, dyspnea, cardiac arrhythmia. And the treatment for this problem together with anything that elevates so much the urea will be hemodialysis or organ transplant. Here the chemical composition of the different nitrogenous wastes. So this is ammonia, this is urea, uric acid and creatinine. The kidneys are located within the abdominal cavity and they are projected at the level of T12 through L3 in the posterior abdominal wall and the right kidney it's a little bit slower so, sorry lower than the left because the right lobe of the liver pushes this uh, kidney down. And because of this, the left kidney is more elevated and actually rib number 12 will be crossing in the middle of the left kidney or projecting. The kidneys are located behind a membrane that we have in the abdominal cavity that is called the peritoneum. And because they are located behind the peritoneum, they will be considered retroperitoneal together with the ureters, urinary bladder, and the blood vessels of the kidneys, which will be the renal artery and vein, and also the adrenal glands. The kidneys have the size of a bar of bath soap, and they have a lateral surface that it is convex and a medial surface that it is concave. And within this medial surface, we have the hilum that helps to receive the blood vessels, the nerves, lymphatics, and then it's where the ureters will exit the hilum. There is these three protective layers of connective tissue that surrounds the kidneys. The most outer layer will be the renal fascia that it is just deep to the parietal peritoneum and that helps to bind it into the abdominal wall. The next one will be the perirenal fat capsule, which is made out of fat. And 
It cushions the kidney and helps to hold it in place. And then the next layer, the most internal layer, will be the fibrous capsule that actually directly get in contact with the kidneys. And it helps to protect the kidneys from trauma and infection. This fibrous capsule is made out of collagen fibers and extends from the fibrous capsule to the renal fascia. So this is the anterior and posterior view of the organs of the urinary system. So here we have the kidneys with their convex surface, the lateral surface, the concavity, the medial surface, which is the hilum. And then we have the blood vessels coming in and out of the hilum. So we have the renal artery, we have the renal vein, renal veins drain into the inferior vena cava, and the renal arteries are branches of the descending abdominal aorta. And then here we have uh, a structure that we call the renal pelvis, and then we have the ureter that goes down and connects to the urinary bladder, and finally we have the urethra. If you see this projection in the posterior view of the kidneys, you can see how the right kidney is a little bit lower than the left. So this is the rib number 12, and this rib number 12 passes along this uh, mid portion of the kidney or uh, projects. If you make a cross section of this area, the lumbar area of the abdominal cavity, you can see this peritoneal membrane. This peritoneal membrane, we will see it again in the digestive system, but this is located in the abdominal cavity and makes a compartment. So anything posterior, any organ posterior to this membrane will be called retroperitoneal. And anything anterior to this membrane, it will be called intraperitoneal. So if you see here, the kidneys are retroperitoneal because they're located behind the peritoneum. And you, you can see here all the different layers, the connective tissue layers that protects the kidneys. So this is the renal fascia, and then we have the perirenal cap fat capsule, which is this, and then here we will have the fibrous capsule in direct contact with the kidneys. If you make this longitudinal section of the kidneys, you will be able to see that they are subdivided into a cortex, which is the area of the kidney that is closer to the capsule, the renal capsule, the fibrous capsule, and then into this region, the mid region that will be called the renal medulla. So in this section, you can see uh, in the longitudinal section, you can see this part of the tissue of the kidneys, which is called the renal parenchyma. This renal parenchyma has like a C-shape in the frontal section or the coronal section, the one that we just looked. And then this will encircle the sinus, the pr renal parenchyma, and then in the renal sinus, which is the equivalent to the hilum, you will have all these blood vessels, the lymphatic vessels, the nerves, and the urine collecting structures. And within this hilum or renal sinus, we have fat cells that help to protect and hold these structures into place. So the zones of the renal parenchyma will be the renal cortex, and the renal medulla. And within the renal medulla, we have two major structures. We have the renal columns, and then we have the renal pyramids. We have these triangular renal pyramids that are between six to 10, that has a base of the pyramid that faces the cortex, and it has an apex that is also known as the renal papilla that faces the hilum or the sinus. 
Within the renal columns, we have uh, blood vessels that runs in and out uh, into the cortex or into the medulla. Now, the lobe of the kidney will be the functional structure of the entire kidney is where you have one pyramid and its overlying cortex. Within the hilum, we have, or next to the hilum, we have the mi minor calyces that nestles the papilla of each pyramid. And within these minor calyces, we collect the urine. And two to three minor calyces will merge to form major calyces. And then two to three major calyces will merge to form the renal pelvis. And the renal pelvis will drain the urine that it was collected in there into the ureter, which is the continuation of the renal pelvis. And this ureter is going to bring the urine from the kidneys into the urinary bladder. So this is the gross anatomy of the kidneys. So here you have renal cortex, and in here you have the renal medulla. Within the renal medulla, you have these triangular structures that are known as the pyramids. The base of the pyramid, which is this, faces the cortex, while the tip faces the calyces. So the calyces receive urine, the minor calyces receives the urine, and two to three minor calyces, they merge and they form these major calyces. And then two to three major calyxes or calyces will merge and form this funnel-like structure that receives the entire urine from the kidneys, which is known as the renal pelvis. And then the renal pelvis continuate as the ureter. It's an elongated tube that drains the urine from the kidneys into the urinary bladder. And in here you can see uh, this renal artery and renal vein. And in between the pyramids, we have these renal columns that allows these branches of the uh, renal artery to come into the cortex and also to allow the passage of these uh, veins that are going to drain into the renal vein. So here are some of the functions of the kidneys. So the kidneys will, will help to filter the blood to excrete the toxic wastes from our body. And also they help to regulate the blood volume blood pressure, the osmolarity or the concentration of solutes within our blood, and also helps to, <coughs> excuse me, helps to regulate ion levels like sodium, potassium, calcium, etc., and also regulates the concentration of hydrogen ions or the pH acid-base balance. Along with that, the kidneys secretes its hormone, erythropoietin, which helps to produce red blood cells. So this erythropoietin, remember from the first chapter, it will go and binds to the cells in the bone marrow, the stem cells, and then allows them to produce red blood cells. The kidneys also helps to regulate calcium levels by participating in this synthesis of calcitriol and helps to clear hormones from our blood, detoxify free radicals, and if someone is starving, the kidneys have a way to produce glucose out of amino acids, so it's capable of gluconeogenesis. Within the kidneys, we have this structural and functional unit uh, at the microscopic level that it are called the nephrons. And Within this kidney, we have around 1.2 million nephrons. And the nephrons has two major parts. So it has the renal corpuscle that helps to filtrate our blood plasma, and then a series of tubules that are called the renal tubule. And this renal tubule helps to convert the filtrate into urine. 
Now let's talk about the uh, specific characteristics of the renal corpuscle. So within the renal corpuscle, we have a tuft of capillaries that it is known as the glomerulus. And this glomerulus, this tuft of capillaries, are, are protected by a double membrane. So this double membrane is known as the parietal and visceral glomerular capsule. So the parietal is the outer layer that protects these capillaries, and it is made of simple squamous epithelium. The visceral layer, it is in close contact with some cells that are called the podocytes, and these podocytes will wrap around the capillaries of the glomerulus. And in between the parietal and the visceral layer, we have a capsular space that helps to receive the filtrate. So these are the components of the nephron. So we have this glomerular uh, corpuscle, and then we have these tubules. With Within this renal corpuscle, we have this double membrane, which is the glomerular capsule, and the actual uh, podocytes. Now, the tubules of the tubular part of the nephron are the following. The one that it is close to the renal corpuscle will be proximal convoluted tubule, or PCT. Then we will have this U-shaped structure that we will call the nephron loop. And within the nephron loop, we have a descending limb, or a part that goes down. And then we have this thin segment, which is this. And then we have this thick segment, which is this. And the thick segment is located within the ascending limb. And then we have this tubule that is called the distal convoluted tubule, or DCT. And then connected to this distal convoluted tubule, we have this uh, almost vertical structure that we call the collecting duct, or CD. These 1.2 million nephrons that we have are subdivided into regions, and they are named according to the region where they are located. So we have 85% of all the nephrons located within the cortex, and these nephrons will be called cortical nephrons. These cortical nephrons will have a short nephron loop, and Around this nephron, sorry, around this PCT and DCT from the cortical nephrons, we have some capillaries that are called the peritubular capillaries. Now, 15% of these 1.2 million nephrons will be located at a region next to the medulla. This is called the juxtamedullary nephrons. And these juxtamedullary nephrons will have a very long nephron loops, and they help to maintain a gradient of osmolarity or salinity within the medulla that helps to preserve water. And just running on the sides of these nephron loops, we have some capillaries that are called basa recta. So, this is the uh, structure of the cortical nephrons, and this is the structure of the juxtamedullary nephrons. So these cortical nephrons, they have a short loop, as you can see here. This is the loop. And surrounding this PCT and DCT, we have these capillaries that we call the peritubular capillaries, as you can see here. And then this juxtamedular nephron, which is close to the medulla, it has long loops, like this one that you can see here. And running next to these loops, we have 
these blood vessels that we call the basa recta. So this area is the cortex and this is the medulla. And these uh, cortical nephrons, one of the functions is to produce urine. And these juxtamedullary nephrons, they produce urine too, but they help to concentrate the urine. So the kidneys, they have uh, this following uh, circulation. So they receive 21% of the cardiac output and this is called the renal fraction. They receive this many blood supply from the renal arteries coming from the aorta because they are very active to excrete all these wastes from our body. And this is the following divisions of the blood vessels that runs through the kidneys. So we have the renal arteries, and this is a key point, so you need to, to know this. So the renal arteries, which are branches of the aorta, will form the interlobar arteries. And then they will form the arcuate arteries, and then the cortical radiate artery, and then the cortical radiate artery will form an arteriole. This will be called the afferent arteriole. And the arteriole will form a ball or tuft of capillaries that we know as the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is going to drain the blood into the efferent arteriole. And then the efferent arteriole is going to drain into the pertubular capillaries. Now the capillaries then will drain the blood into the cortical radiate veins or directly into the arcuate veins, and the arcuate veins will drain into the interlobar veins and then into the renal vein, and finally the renal vein is going to drain the blood into the inferior vena cava. So this is the diagram of the renal circulation. So here you have the renal artery, the branch of the aorta. This renal artery is going to form these two to three segmental arteries here within the hilum. And then these segmental arteries are going to run in between the pyramids, which are these. And now they're going to be called interlobar. So renal artery is going to change its name into segmental here within the hilum next to these minor calices, and then the segmental, when it runs in between the pyramids, is going to be called interlobar. This interlobar next to the base of the pyramids is going to make this turn, and now this is going to be called the arcuate artery. And then the arcuate artery is going to send these branches towards the cortex. And these branches are going to be called the cortical radiate. And then the cortical radiate is going to form the afferent arterioles or arriving arterioles. And then the afferent arterioles are going to form these capillaries, tuft of capillaries that we will be calling glomeruli or glomerulus. And then the glomerulus is going to drain the blood into the efferent arteriole, and then the efferent arteriole is going to drain into the peritubular capillaries, and then the peritubular capillaries into the cortical radiate vein, and then the cortical radiate veins, which are these ones in blue, are going to drain into this arcuate, ar sorry, arcuate vein, which is the one that runs just by the base of the pyramids. And then this arcuate vein is going to drain into these veins that run in between the pyramids in the columns. So this will be the arcuate veins. And then the arcuate veins, they drain in the interlobar veins and then into the renal vein and then into the inferior vena cava. So this is the flow from the aorta to renal artery, which is this, then segmental, 
then interlover, then arcuate, artery, cortical radiate, then afferent arterial, glomerulus, efferent arterial, and then peritubular capillaries, and then cortical radiate veins, which are these, and then arcuate veins, and then interlover veins, renal vein, and then inferior vena cava. And if you magnify uh, the cortex, you can see how this arcuate artery gives rise to this cortical radiate. So these are the cortical radiate. And then the cortical radiate will form this afferent arteriole, and then you have this tuft of capillaries, and then you drain the blood into this efferent arteriole and then into these peritubular capillaries, and then these peritubular, peritubular capillaries will drain into this cortical radiate vein, which is this, oops, cortical radiate vein, and then the cortical radiate vein will drain into the arcuate vein, which is this. So remember, veins are in blue, and arteries are in red. The kidneys are innervated by the renal plexus. And this renal plexus, it is located by the renal artery and they will form these nerve fibers that will run together with the branches of the renal artery and then they will help to regulate the diameter of the blood vessels and the convoluted tubules of the nephron. This renal plexus, it is part of the sympathetic system. So the sympathetic system is going to stimulate this glomerular blood flow and rate to reduce urine production. So it will decrease the glomerular blood flow so you can produce less urine. And this sympathetic system will become activated if you have hypotension. So at some point it makes sense if you have hypotension, if you have less blood volume, there is no purpose for you to form urine. So you need to preserve water so you will reduce the flow through the glomerulus, the flow of blood by vasoconstricting your blood vessels. And then you secrete a hormone that is called renin that helps to increase blood pressure. And then the kidneys also have uh, parasympathetic system innervation, but the function is unknown. Within this renal corpuscle, we have two poles. We have the vascular pole where you have the entry and exit of the afferent and efferent arterioles. And then opposite to this vascular pole, we have the urinary pole where the renal tubule begins. So this is a magnification of the renal corpuscle. So here you have the vascular pole where you have the afferent arteriole arriving, remember, afferent for arriving, and then we have the efferent pole for exiting. And then across this vascular pole, we have this renal pole in which you have the beginning of the renal tubule. And now that we, we are here, let's look at the components of the renal corpuscle. So here are the two capsules. So this is the parietal layer of the glomerular capsule made out of simple squamous epithelium. Why is it called simple squamous? Because we have only one layer of cells and the cells are flat or scale-like. And then we have these podocytes, these cells that wraps around these capillaries, the glomerulus that forms the visceral layer. The podocytes are called podocytes because they, they look like little feet. Poros means feet, sites means cell. 
uh, and then uh, <coughs> the space between the pareto layer which is this of the glomerular capsule and the visceral layer it is the capsular space so as the blood is going into this glomerulus is uh, getting filtrated and this filtrate goes into the glomerular space and then from the glomerular space the fluid the filtrate will go into the PCT and now it will change its name instead of being called filtrate this fluid now it's going to be called tubular fluid If you look at the tissue of the kidneys with the uh, light, mi light microscope, you will be able to see the glomerulus, which is this. This is a tuft of capillaries. And then you, you will be able to see part of the uh, PCT and DCT, which are these, the tubules. Now let's talk about the details of the renal tubule. So the renal tubule is also called uriniferous tubule. And <coughs> this tubule has, as, as I said before, four regions. So it has the region that it is closer to the renal corpuscle, which is the PCT or proximal convoluted tubule. Then it has this U-shaped structure that we call the nephron loop or loop of Henle, H-E-N-L-E. And then we have uh, next to the loop of Henle, we have the DCT or distal convoluted tubule. And then <clears throat> we will have the collecting duct that will receive the fluid from many nephrons. Now for the PCT, so this PCT will arise from the glomerular capsule. So it's a continuation of the glomerular capsule and the function is is to reabsorb. So 65% of the fluid that comes from the renal corpuscle will be reabsorbed by the PCT. The PCT is the longest and most coil region of the tubules of the nephron and it has this epithelium that it is important for reabsorption. So we have simple cuboidal epithelium with a lot of microbially. What did you what do we absorb in the PCT? We have reabsorption of water, glucose, electrolytes, vitamins. So most of the things that go through the filtrate are reabsorbed by the renal uh, by the PCT. And the reabsorption in the PCT happens by a mechanism that uses these transporters. So here we have this magnification of the uh, area where you have the tubular fluid. So this will be the apical region of the cells. This will be the cells of the PCT, the uh, simple cuboidal cells with uh, microbili, which will be represented by these br little brown lines. Uh, also known as brush border and this will be the basal side and here we have the pertubular capillaries that surrounds this PCT. So within the ap apical region of this PCT we have co-transporters like sodium glucose co-transporter, we have an antiporter in which you uh, exchange sodium for hydrogen ions. You have a, an antiport for anions and uh, chloride. And then you also have aquaporins. Aquaporins are little channels that allows the transfer of water. So this transport that happens at the apical surface of the cell will be transcellular transport. And then you can have also paracellular transport in which the substances can go in between the cells, like water, urea, uric acid, sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, calcium, and inorganic phosphate can go 
in between the cells of the PCT. Now, once you absorb uh, these substances uh, or these molecules on the cells of the PCT, you can transport them into the circulatory system using these uh, transporters that we have in the basal site. So we have a glucose transporter and we have this antiporter or sodium potassium pump in which you exchange sodium for potassium or you can have this antiport for potassium and chloride. So that's the way that uh, we reabsorb things in the PCT by using this. Uh, most of the time, most these proteins that are uh, transporters, antiporters. <coughs> now for the nephron loop uh, characteristics. So it has a U shape and it has a descending and an ascending limb. Within this loop, we have uh, this thick segment that it has simple cuboidal epithelium and that it is located at the initial part of the descending limb and part or all of the ascending limb. So within this thick segment, we reabsorb 25% of sodium, potassium, and chloride. And within the thin segment, we have simple squamous epithelium, and this will be located at the lower part of the descending limb, and in here the cells will be very permeable for, to water. So these are the different uh, regions of the loop. So here we have the descending limb and the ascending limb. Within the ascending limb, we have this thick segment. And within this ascending limb, we have variable reabsorption of water. As you can see here, we can reabsorb water. And then within this thick segment, we can reabsorb different uh, ions like sodium, uh, potassium, chloride. And just because of this, we can have uh, differences in concentration of solutes inside the tubular fluid. So as the tubular fluid moves from the PCT, which is this, into the des uh, descending loop, you will have increased concentration of solutes because you are absorbing water. And as you are absorbing water, you are concentrating these salts or these uh, ions. So you are increasing the osmolarity. So you go from 300 up to 1200 milliosmoles. And you, as, as you move this fluid up into the loop, you start reabsorbing different ions like sodium, potassium, and chloride. And then you are decreasing then the concentration of these solutes. So you go back from uh, 1200 up to 400, 200, and then you start here at the DCT with a milliosmol concentration of 200. And this will create uh, something that we call countercurrent multiplier of the nephron loop in which you start uh, concentrating this uh, region within the medulla that it is going to be important for preserving water because as you increase the concentration here outside of this nephron loop, you have the collecting duct that will help to absorb water and uh, you have the vasa recta surrounding in here as well this mainly these juxtamedullary nephrons so you will have an increased concentration of sodium chloride and potassium chloride and urea and this vasa recta will help to place water in here to dilute a little bit of this concentration 
and then you absorb water from the collecting duct into this space to concentrate urine. Now for the DCT or the distal convoluted tubule, it begins shortly after the ascending limb re-enters the cortex. So when this happens, then you start having this slow con or low concentration of solutes that helps in the secretion of different substances into the tubular fluid at the distal convoluted tubule. And together, the distal convoluted tubule with the DCT will reabsorb variable amounts of water and salt and are regulated by several hormones. Some of these hormones that regulates the reabsorption of the DCT and the collecting duct will be aldosterone, atrial natriuretic peptide, ADH or antidiuretic hormone and parathyroid hormone. And in here in the DCT, we have cuboidal epithelium without microbially. And DCT will end the structure of the nephron. So the collecting duct begins in the cortex where it receives the tubular fluid. And after it receives this tubular fluid, now the tubular fluid is going to change its name. Now it's going to be urine. And the distal, com uh, the collecting duct, sorry, will run through the medulla and it will reabsorb water. Through this reabsorption of water, you can prevent dehydration in the case when someone doesn't ingest so much water. And the medullary portion of the CD is more permeable to water than to sodium chloride. And because of this, it can concentrate the urine. And as urine is passing by through this increasing salty medulla, the water will follow the sodium chloride concentrate the urine. Now the collecting duct will receive the tubular fluid from several distal convoluted tubules from several nephrons. And these collecting ducts will merge at the tip of the medullary pyramid. So it will merge at the papillary duct. And 30 papillary ducts will form the minor calyces. And the collecting and papillary ducts are lined with simple cuboidal epithelium. So the flow of fluid from the point where the glomerular filtrate is formed to the point where urine leaves the body is the following. So you have the filtrate starting at the glomerular capsule. And then once you empty this filtrate into the PCT, now it's going to be called tubular fluid. So the tubular fluid from the PCT will run into the nephron loop and then into the distal convoluted tubule, into the collecting ducts, into the papillary ducts, into the minor calyces, into the major calyces, into the renal pelvis, into the ureter, into the urinary bladder, and then into the urethra. So this will be how the, the fluid will move. So from the glomerular space, the filtrate. Now it's going to be called this tubular fluid in the PCT. Then it will run into the nephron loop, into the DCT, into the collecting ducts, into the papillary ducts, into the minor calyces, into the major calyces, into the renal pelvis, and then into the ureter, into the urinary bladder, into the urethra, and outside of the body. And again, one of the major functions of the collecting duct is to concentrate urine by having a lot of reabsorption of water because you have increased here the salinity 
or the concentration of sodium chloride outside of this collecting duct in the medulla. So in the medulla is where we reabsorb most of the water and then we can concentrate the urine. So here are the different hormones that influence the concentration of urine. So we have aldosterone, which is also known as salt retaining hormone. The aldosterone hormone, it is produced within the adrenal cortex. And when you have aldosterone circulating throughout your blood, you will have these aquaporins being inserted into the collecting duct and then you will start reabsorbing water. Now not only you will start reabsorbing water but also you will start reabsorbing sodium and sodium will be reabsorbed within the DCT. Now what will be the triggers for the secretion of aldosterone? Well when you have hyponatremia or when you have or, which is the same as having low concentration of sodium and when you have high concentration of potassium or hyperkalemia because actually aldosterone helps to excrete potassium and when you have a drop in the blood pressure you have the release of renin and then you have the formation of angiotensin 2 which is going to stimulate your adrenal gland to secrete aldosterone. So one of the major uh, triggers then for secreting aldosterone will be the drop in the blood pressure. So again the functions of aldosterone will be to absorb sodium and water and secretes potassium. And then water is reabsorbed because water will follow sodium and also chloride will follow uh, sodium because remember sodium is a positive ion so it's a cation and chloride it's a negative ion which is an, an ion so by the law of opposite attract the chloride which is negative will follow the positive which is sodium and then the next effect of the action then of aldosterone will be to retain sodium uh, and chloride and then water which will increase the blood volume and then you will increase blood pressure and in this case you will reduce the formation of urine so you will have less urine being produced and then you will have a urine that has elevated potassium concentration because you are getting rid of potassium another hormone that influences the concentration or the amount of urine will be the natriuretic peptides. Natriuretic peptides are secreted by uh, the cells of the atria in the heart in response to increased blood return or increased blood pressure. So the major trigger for the secretion of these atrial natriuretic peptides will be the increase in blood pressure and when you have atrial natriuretic peptides released into your blood you will excrete more salt natriuretic means excretion of salt in your urine so natrium is the latin word for sodium and uretic means that you are urinating and then when you are excreting sodium then because you have in your bloodstream natriuretic peptides you will excrete water because again water will follow sodium and then you will reduce the blood volume and then you will reduce the blood pressure so what is going to be the result of this is that you will dilate the afferent arteriole and then you will constrict your afferent arteriole. That will increase your glomerular filtration rate or GFR so you will filtrate more and that will inhibit the secretion of renin which is going to increase the blood pressure so you will prevent 
blood pressure from going up and then you prevent also the secretion of aldosterone so you will want reabsorb sodium and then you will inhibit the secretion of a hormone that is called ADH or, or antidiuretic hormone so uh, you will again prevent uh, retaining urine and then you will in inhibit the sodium chloride reabsorption by the collecting duct now ADH or antidiuretic hormone, it's a hormone that it is actually produced in the hypothalamus, but it is secreted by the posterior pituitary gland. ADH is secreted when someone is dehydrated, when someone has lost blood volume uh, because of a hemorrhage, or when someone has increased blood osmolarity, because let's say that you have ingested a very salty meal or uh, you have ingested something that is rich in sugar like ice cream and that will stimulate some uh, of the cells in our body like battery receptors or the hypothalamic osmoreceptors so within the hypothalamus we have these cells the osmoreceptors that helps to detect the concentration of sodium or the concentration of glucose so the osmolarity and then when you have increased osmolarity, then you will release ADH and then ADH will make your collecting duct cells more permeable to water. So you will insert these aquaporins and then you will absorb water, which is going to increase blood volume and then it will increase blood pressure. Now, PTH also influences the presence of certain ions within the uh, urine. So, PTH is secreted by our parathyroid hormone, is secreted by the parathyroid glands just posterior to your thyroid gland, which is located in the neck. And this PTH will be released when you have hypocalcemia. And when you release this PTH, the PTH will bind to cells on the PCT and will increase the secretion of uh, phosphate and it will act also on the cells of the thick segment of the loop of Henle so you can increase the absorption of calcium so you will prevent the loss of calcium so you will increase calcium levels and you will increase at the same time the excretion of phosphate because phosphate is not retained calcium ions will stay in circulation rather than precipitating into bone as calcium phosphate. So you will prevent the storage of calcium. And then PTH also stimulates the synthesis of calcitriol by the epithelial cells of the proximal convoluted tubule. So in summary, for this first part is that the PCT will reabsorb 65% of the glomerular filtrate and it will help to return this filtrate into the peritubular capillaries and much of this reabsorption happens because you have osmosis and these co-transport mechanisms that we already mentioned and also uh, helps in the transport of sodium. The nephron loop will help to reabsorb 25% of the filtrate and the DCT together with the collecting duct will help to reabsorb the rest and the DCT will reabsorb sodium chloride and water under the influence of uh, hormones like uh, aldosterone and AMP. The tubules also help to extract from our body drugs, wastes, and some solids from the blood and secrete them into the tubular fluid. And the DCT will help in the formation of making urine and the collecting duct helps to preserve water. So this is the summary of reabsorption and secretion. So here are the uh, things that we can reabsorb in blue and the things that we can excrete or secrete in pink color. So we secrete urea, we can secrete hydrogen ions here to regulate the pH, 
potassium, ammonium, some drugs, etc. So our kidneys will help to concentrate urine and to form one to two liters of urine out of 180 liters of glomerular filtrate. That's how much filtrate we receive. And two thirds of the water of this filtrate, as we mentioned before, will be reabsorbed in the PCT, like 65% or so. And in here we will reabsorb solutes that makes the tissue fluid to be hypertonic to the tubular fluid. And because of this, we will have the water following by osmosis, this hypertonic environment through these paracellular and tracellular routes that we already mentioned. And in the PCT, the water is reabsorbed at a constant rate. And when this happens, we have what we call obligatory water reabsorption, just the water that follows this high osmolarity. Now the process of formation of urine happens by four mechanisms. Glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion, and water conservation. The glomerular filtrate, which is the fluid that is found in the capsular space, will have similar composition as the blood plasma except that it has almost no protein. And then the tubular fluid, once it goes into the PCT and then into the DCT, will change its concentration of different ions and different concentrations of water based on what are your specific needs. And lastly, the urine will enter into the collecting duct and it can undergo a little bit of changes depending in your hydration levels. So these are the basic stages of the urine formation then. As the blood is flowing through this glomerulus in the renal corpuscle, you start filtrating this plasma and then the filtrate will move into the capsular space and then from there you will move this filtrate and start reabsorbing anything that it is needed in your body and then it will move into the peritubular capillaries and then your peritubular capillaries will secrete substances and then from there the substances will move into the DCT and then into the collecting duct and within the collecting ducts and the DCT you can reabsorb water or conserve water and return it to the blood. So this is another key point for urine concentration. Removal of water or water conservation happens under the influence of ADH. And ADH increases the permeability of the collecting ducts to water to help to concentrate the urine. And concentrated urine is formed by the increase in facultative water reabsorption, secretion of ADH by the posterior pituitary gland, and insertion of aquaporins in the membrane of the collecting ducts. And having a high concentration of sodium chloride in the interstitial fluid that surrounds the collecting duct to aid in the absorption of water or the conservation of water. So now we will start talking about the actual formation of the filtrate within the glomerulus. So this is the scanning electron micrograph showing you how the glomerulus is surrounded by these cells, the podocytes. 
and the podocytes has these extensions that are known as pedicels. And then the pedicels are separated by narrow filtration slits. If you make a view with an electron microscopy, you can see here the capsular space, the podocytes that surrounds these endothelial cells of the capillaries, and then these filtration slits, which are corresponding to this. So within the glomerulus, we have this special filtration in which water and some solutes in the plasma can pass through these capillaries of the glomerulus into the capsular space, but you prevent anything larger than the size of the filtration slits to go into this capsular space. So filtration happens in this glomerulus, which forms this filtration membrane, the glomerulus, together with the podocytes. So the filtration membrane has three barriers. It has this endothelium, which is fenestrated. It has these pores of the glomerular capillaries. And these fenestrations has a di uh, uh, length of between 70 to 90 nanometers. So they are very, very tiny. And these filtration pores allow the passage of many substances with the exception of blood cells. And these filtration pores are so many making these capillaries to be highly permeable. But no red blood cells should leave the glomerular capillaries. And then we have the second layer of this filtration membrane, which is the basement membrane. And the basement membrane has uh, this proteoglycan gel-like layer that it has a negative charge. And it will exclude the filtration of substances or molecules greater than 80 nanometers. Along with that, this negative charge will prevent the excretion of proteins that most of times has negative charges, like albumin. So albumin is repelled from passing the basement membrane because it has a negative charge. The basement membrane is negatively charged. And blood plasma is 7% protein, and the filtrate, when it passes through this filtration membrane, it has only 0 0.03 protein. Now, the other part of the filtration membrane will be the filtration slits that are spaces between the pedicels in the podocytes. And this filtration slit has a length of 30 nanometers in diameter. Also, these filtration slits are negatively charged which prevents the passage of negatively charged molecules. So this is the diagram to show you then the components of the filtration membrane. So this is the capillaries, these are the glomerulus. This will be the endothelial cells of the glomerulus with these filtration pores. And then these filtration pores do not allow most molecules greater than 80 nanometers in diameter to pass, including red blood cells or white blood cells, plasma proteins, large anions, protein-bound minerals and hormones, etc. And then we have here the basement membrane with this proteoglycan layer that it is negatively charged. And then we have this filtration slit of the podocytes. So things that can pass through this filtration membrane, water, electrolytes, glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, urea, uric acid, and creatinine. And then in here you, you have the capsular space. So this is a great magnification of this uh, glomerular membrane or filtration membrane. So inside these pedicels, we have the glomerulus, and this will be the filtration slits of these pedicels, and this is the body of the podocytes. 
So this is another key point. Any substance larger than albumin won't pass the filtration membrane. And almost any molecule smaller than 3 nanometers can pass freely through the filtration pore. And we already mentioned which, which were they, including nitrogenous wastes. And some substances of low molecular weight that are bound to plasma proteins and cannot get through the membrane like most calcium, iron, and thyroid membrane, uh, like, uh, sorry, thyroid hormone, uh, cannot pass this filtration membrane. Unless these substances are unbound, so they are not attached to one protein, they can pass freely into the filtrate. So one way then to retain any of these important things like calcium, iron, or thyroid hormone is to bind them to plasma proteins so that they cannot go through the, through the membrane. So one of the functions of this filtration membrane is to prevent kidney infections and trauma can damage this uh, filtration membrane. And when you have uh, trauma or even infections in this filtration membrane, you will create big gaps within this filtration membrane and albumin and blood cells can escape. And you can have proteinuria like albuminuria or hematuria or presence of blood in the urine. Another ca cause for damage to this filtration membrane is hypoxia. So when someone uh, has hypoxia, like in distance runners or swimmers, they can have this filtration membrane damage and then they can have temporary proteinuria or even hematuria. Now filtration happens due to two major pressure uh, pressures happening. So we have hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressures on each side of the filtration membrane. The name of the hydrostatic pressure specifically is going to be called blood hydrostatic pressure or BHP. And this BHP is going to be high in the glomerular capillaries. So you will have in the glomerular capillaries 60 millimeters of mercury or BHP and in comparison to other capillaries in the body, which have 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury, the glomerular capillaries have high BHP. Now, because the afferent arteriole is larger than the efferent arteriole, you will have high blood pressure in these glomerular capillaries or high blood hydrostatic pressure. Now, hydrostatic pressure in the capsular space is very minimal. It's 18 millimeters of mercury because you have high filtration rate and continu continual accumulation of fluid in the capsule. The other pressure that influence filtration rate is called colloid osmotic pressure or COP. And this COP is about the same as the COP in the capillaries around our body, so it's 32 millimeters of mercury. And the glomerular filtrate, it is almost protein free and has no significant COP or colloid osmotic pressure. So since we don't have as many proteins in the capsular space, the colloid osmotic pressure in the capsular space is almost none. So we have a higher outward pressure of 60 millimeters of mercury opposed by two inward pressures, 18 and 32. And if you subtract this 18 plus 32 from the 60, you will end up with 10 millimeters of mercury. So this will be called net filtration pressure. And high blood pressure in the glomerulus will make the kidneys vulnerable to hypertension. And this can lead to rupture of the glomerular capillaries and produces scarring 
in the kidney. This is called nephrosclerosis and atherosclerosis of renal blood vessels. And ultimately, if you have nephrosclerosis in a huge amount of tissue within the kidneys, you will end up with renal failure. So this is a diagram or a picture to show you what are the forces involved in glomerular filtration. So here you have the afferent arterial and this is the efferent arterial. The efferent arterial is wider than the efferent arterial. So more blood can come in than what it can come out of the glomerulus. And because of this, you increase your blood hydrostatic pressure. So you have a high pressure in here, so 60 uh, millimeters of mercury. So this blood hydrostatic pressure will tend to move the fluid into the capsular space, which is this. And you have uh, proteins here within this uh, glomerulus that makes a colloid osmotic pressure of 32 millimeters of mercury. Together with that, we have a capsular pressure or hydrostatic, hydrostatic pressure within the glomerulus, sorry, glomerular space, that it is 18 millimeters of mercury. So if you subtract this two pressures, the colloid osmotic pressure and the capsular pressure that tends to move the fluid into the capillaries. From this pressure that tends to move the, the fluids out of the capillaries, so 60 minus 32 minus 18, which is found in here, will give you a net filtration pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury. Because of this difference of pressure, the fluid will tend to move out forming this filtration or this filtrate. So we have this glomerular filtration rate or GFR, which is the amount of filtrate that is formed per minute by the ki two kidneys combined. So we can calculate your GFR multiplying your net filtration pressure by the filtration coefficient that it's a coefficient that will depend on how permeable are your glomerulus and what will be the surface area of the filtration barrier. So how many basically glomerular endothelium you have healthy. And in males, the glomerular filtration rate is 125 millimeters uh, per sorry, milliliters per minute. So they form filtrate of 125 mil milliliters per minute or 100 liter, uh, 180 liters of filtrate per day. And then females will form less 105 milliliters of filtrate per minute or 150 liters of filtrate per day. Out of these, we reabsorb 99% of the filtrate. So we end up producing one to two liters of urine per day. We can have changes in the glomerular fil filtration rate, depending on your osmolarity and other physiological uh, conditions. So if your glomerular filtration rate is high, the fluid will flow through the renal tubules too rapidly for them to reabsorb the usual amount of water and solutes, and the urine output will rise. You will have a chance of dehydration and electrolyte depletion if that happens. Now, if your glomerular filtration is low, you will reabsorb more wastes and you're, you will accumulate nitrogenous wastes in your body so you can have azotemia. So this is what happens then when someone has kidney failure. They will have poor glomerular filtration rate because they have a lot of glomerular uh, cells destroyed and then they cannot excrete 
the nitrogenous wasted, so they are reabsorbing this uh, urea, uric acid, etc., and then they will have a sotemia. GFR, uh, it is controlled by adjusting the perfusion of the glomerulus from moment to moment. And there are three mechanisms that controls the glomerular filtration rate. We have something that is called glomerular or renal autoregulation. We have sympathetic control and hormonal control. So in renal autoregulation, you will have this perfusion into the glomerulus. And then as the fluid is moving from the renal corpuscle into the PCT, the loop, and the DCT, you will detect the status of the concentration of ions or solutes within the tubular fluid. And then you will adjust the filtration rate accordingly. So if you need to retain certain ions, you will regulate the filtration or reabsorption. So you will regulate your filtric composition and then you will stabilize the performance of the kidney and you also compensate for filtrations in the blood pressure. One of the cells or one of the parts of the kidneys that helps to control this is the juxtaglomerular complex, which is a structure. This is the other key point. What is the juxtaglomerular complex? So it's a structure formed by the juxtaglomerular cells and the macula densa cells that are found at the end of the nephron loop, where it just had re-entered the renal cortex, so next to the DCT. And these juxtaglomerular cells of the renin, sorry, of the juxtaglomerular complex will secrete renin if the blood pressure drops. So here is the location of the juxtaglomerular apparatus or complex. So here you have the nephron loop. And then within the nephron loop, we have these macula densa cells that together with these juxtaglomerular cells will form the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So whenever there is a drop in the blood pressure, these cells of the juxtaglomerular complex will secrete renin. And renin will help to increase the blood pressure. How these cells detect the changes in blood pressure? Well, because we have these nerves that help to take the diameter of the blood vessels. So the sympathetic control of the sympathetic nerve fibers that richly innervate the blood vessels can detect changes in the blood pressure. The sympathetic nervous system together with these cells help to control the blood pressure. So the sympathetic system specifically is going to be correlated with the formation of epinephrine. And when you release epinephrine, you will constrict your afferent arterioles. And this can happen when someone is doing a strenuous exercise or when someone has a drop in the blood pressure, like when someone has a circulatory shock. This will help to constrict these afferent arterioles to prevent more blood going into the glomerulus and you will have less pressure in the glomerulus, so this will reduce your glomerular filtration rate and urinary output because you need, you need to increase blood volume. And at some point also, you will help to redirect the blood that instead of going to the kidneys, going into the heart and the brain, and in the case of exercise, into the skeletal muscles. When you do that, you can decrease so much your glomerular filtration rate. So you can have as, lo as low as few milliliters per minute instead of the 125 
uh, in males or 105 in females. Now for the renin uh, angiotensin aldosterone mechanism or system. So the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism it's a system of hormones that helps to control the blood pressure and the glomerular filtration rate. This system gets activated when someone has hypotension or drop in the blood pressure. We will have these bad receptors in the carotid arteries and the aorta, remember the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies, that will stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. When the sympathetic nervous system gets activated, they will trigger the release of the renin by the kidneys juxtaglomerular cells that all are also known as granular cells. And then renin is going to activate a protein in our blood that is called angiotensinogen. And then angiotensinogen is going to be converted into angiotensin 1. So it's going to make like a cascade. And then angiotensin 1 is going to be converted in the lungs by an enzyme that is called angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE into angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is going to be a vasoconstrictor that by itself is going to create an increase in the blood pressure. But also angiotensin 2, what it's going to do is going to stimulate the formation of aldosterone by the adrenal cortex. And when aldosterone is released, it's going to stimulate your kidneys to absorb sodium and water, increasing the blood volume and thus increasing the blood pressure. This hormone also is going to stimulate the posterior pituitary gland to secrete ADH so you can promote water reabsorption by stimulating the thirst mechanism, sorry, by stimulating the collecting duct cells to absorb water and also it's going to stimulate your thirst center in the hypothalamus so you can increase the, uh, the ingestion of water. So this is how the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism works. So if you have a drop in the blood pressure and blood volume, your granular cells or juxtaglomerular cells will secrete renin and then this uh, protein that is secreted by the liver, angiotensinogen 1, which is 453 amino acids long, is going to be converted by renin into angiotensin 1, which is going to be a short peptide of 10 amino acids long. And then in your lungs, ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme, is going to be converting this decapeptide into an oct octapeptide, or angiotensin 2, which is going to have 8 amino acid long and then angiotensin 2 is going to create vasoconstriction which is going to elevate blood pressure but it's going to stimulate the formation of aldosterone by the adrenal cortex which is going to lead to the reabsorption of sodium and water and then that is going to increase blood pressure and then it's going to stimulate your hypothalamus to release ADH and then to stimulate your thirst center so you can drink more water and thus elevate blood pressure. So angiotensin 2, what it specifically is going to do in your uh, tubules is going to lead to the absorption of water by the collecting duct and the DCT. So you have a urine volume that it is less, but the concentration is high. So your urine is going to be highly concentrated and very few urine. Okay, so within your kidneys, you have a specific amount that you can transport. So transport maximum is the amount of solute that the renal tubules can reabsorb, and it is limited by the amount of transport proteins that you have available within the tubular cells. So whenever you saturate or occupy all your transporters, any excess of solute won't be reabsorbed and then it will appear in the urine. 
So the transport maximum is reached when the transporters are saturated and each solute has its own transport maximum. So we can absorb an specific, only a specific amount of blood glucose. So whenever someone has a blood glucose level in their uh, system of 220 milligrams per deciliter, you saturate all the glucose transporters that you have in your kidneys and then the person will have glycosuria. When this happens, when someone has diabetes mellitus. And this is just to show you the concept of transfer maximum. So if you have uh, glucose being filtrated by your renal corpuscle, that will pass into the filtrate. And then in here in blue, you have these glucose transfer proteins in the PCT. Whenever you bind glucose then into all of these glucose transporters, you will have, if you don't have so many glucose, normal urine volume and glucose free. If you have high concentration of glucose, like in hyperglycemia, you will saturate all of these glucose transfer proteins and the excess will be removed by the kidneys. So you have glycosuria. So then the substances that we have in the urine can be examined and we can perform a urine analysis. So in urine analysis, it's an examination of the physical and chemical properties of urine and the appearance of the urine will vary from clear to deep amber depending on the state of hydration. So you can have yellow color due to the urochrome pigment from the breakdown of hemoglobin in the red blood cells and if you have cloudiness in your urine or if you have blood that suggests a UTI, a urinary tract infection, having trauma or stones or it might be a contamination with other fluids. Now if someone has pus in their urine this is called pyuria and it pinpoints to a urinary infection. Hematuria is the presence of plain red blood cells in the urine, so the urine will look reddish, and this can be due to a UTI, trauma, or kidney stones. Now you can have hemoglobinuria, in which you can have hemoglobin and not having hematuria. Now if the urine regularly is odorless but the presence of bacteria can degrade urea in the urine and it can transform this urea into ammonia and then the, the the urine will smell like ammonia and some food and diseases can impart uh, particular aromas now the urine has a specific gravity that ranges between 1.001 to 1.028 a specific gravity per milliliter and the osmolarity of the urine can range between 50 to 1200 milliosmoles per liter if the person has a high osmolarity that means that the person is dehydrated. If the person has low osmolarity, that means that the urine is very diluted and that can happen in certain diseases. The pH of the urine can range between 4.5 to 8.2, but usually is acidic, six. And the chemical composition is made out of 95% of water and 5% of solutes. So some of the solutes that you will be able to find in urine is urea, sodium chloride, uh, potassium chloride, creatinine, uric acid, phosphate, sulfates, calcium, magnesium, bicarbonate, urochrome, and a trace of bilirubin. Some things that you shouldn't find in urine is blood cells, glucose, free hemoglobin, albumin, ketone, bile pigments, 
and microorganisms. The volume of urine will vary between one to two liters per day in the adult. And someone, if it's having a urine volume greater than two liters per day, that is called polyuria. And if someone has less than 500 milliliters of urine per, uh, produced per day, this is called oliguria. And anuria is having a urine volume of zero to 100 milliliters per day. Uh, why someone can have uh, oliguria? Well, because he can have kidney disease, dehydration, circulatory shock, or prostate enlargement. And when someone has a urine output of less than 400 milliliters per day, the body cannot maintain a safe low concentration of waste in the plasma. So that will lead to azotemia. Diabetes affects the formation of urine. So these uh, diabetes can be subdivided into diabetes mellitus, type 1 or type 2, and diabetes insipidus, and also into gestational diabetes. In diabetes type 1, 2, and gestational diabetes, you will have high concentration of glucose in the renal tubule. And glucose will oppose the osmotic reabsorption of water. So water will stay in the renal tubules and will be excreted. So it will promote osmotic diuresis. So the person will have a lot of volume of urine in diabetes type 1, 2, and gestational diabetes. And along with that, you can find glucose in urine. Now in diabetes insipidus, you are underproducing or under secreting ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And because you don't have enough antidiuretic hormone, you don't retain as much water. So all the water will be uh, passed through the collecting duct and then you have polyuria or formation of a lot of urine. And in this case, you won't have glycosuria in diabetes insipidus. The name insipidus comes from uh, meaning tasteless. Greek doctors in the uh, times of uh, Socrates and all those philosophers, they used to taste urine to diagnose patients. So whenever the urine tastes uh, sweet, they classified it as diabetes mellitus and whenever the urine that they tasted didn't have this sweet uh, taste, they classified it as insipidus because it was tasteless. Something that can affect the formation of urine is the intake of diuretics. So diuretics, it will be any chemical that increases urine volume. So uh, we can have natural diuretics like caffeine that dilates the afferent arteriole and it, it, it will uh, increase the glomerular filtration rate. Another diuretic will be alcohol because it will inhibit the formation of ADH or the secretion of ADH. And uh, some other diuretics are part of the treatment for hypertension and they can act on the nephron loop that inhibit the symport of sodium chloride and potassium, and the person won't be able to reabsorb as much water as usual. In order to know if our kidneys are functioning, we can for perform renal function tests. So it can help you diagnose uh, kidney diseases evaluate the severity of those diseases, monitor the progresses of such diseases, determine the clearance of the kidneys, and determine the glomerular filtration rate. Renal clearance, what it is, is the volume of blood of plasma from which a particular waste is completely removed in one minute. So it will represent the effect of glomerular filtration rate secretion of substances and reabsorption of substances. So 
the formula for renal clearance will be adding to the glomerular filtration the amount added in the tubular secretion and subtract from there the amount removed by tubular reabsorption. Once you produce urine, you can store urine and later on eliminate the urine. Urine is constantly produced and does not drain continuously from our body, so it has to be stored. And we store the urine in the urinary bladder. And then later on, we can excrete the urine episodically. And this is made by the neural controls that helps to prevent the urinary bladder from either retaining the urine for so much time or releasing it when it's not necessary. So this is again to show you the connection between the organ that produces the urine, which is the kidneys or the organs, the kidneys and the urinary bladder, the the organ that stores the urine. And the urine is transported into the urinary bladder to be stored by the ureters and finally the urine is eliminated by the ureter. This is a pyelogram or uh, imaging view of the different parts of the urinary system. So you can inject contrast material so you can see the ureters, the urinary bladder, and there are major calices and the renal pelvis. So now let's talk about the ureters. The ureters are retroperitoneal organs and are the muscular tubes that connect the kidneys to the urinary bladder. They are very long, they measure like 10 inches in length or 25 centimeters and they enter into the bladder posteriorly and from its base. At the entrance of the, in the urinary bladder, the ureters have a flap like, that acts like a valve preventing the backing up of urine from the urinary bladder into the ureters when we are boiling the urine. The walls of the ureters has three layers. The outer layer, which is the adventitia, which is made out of connective tissue that helps to uh, support the ureters into the surrounding structures. The next layer will be the muscularis that is made of two layers of smooth muscle with a third layer in the low ureter. And these layers undergo a stretching and contraction in a peristaltic wave to transport the urine from proximal regions into distal regions. The most inner layer is called mucosa and is made out of transitional epithelium in which the cells will be tall when they are when the ureter is empty and then they will squish or become flatter when the ureter is filled or full with with urine the lumen of the ureters is narrow when when it's empty and because of this, it can be easily obstructed by kidney stones. This is a cross section of the ureter with its different layers. So this is the outer layer, this is the adventitia, this is the middle layer uh, uh, made out of smooth muscle cells, and this will be the transitional epithelium in the mucosa with the, the lumen in here. So this is the narrow lumen where the urine passes and sometimes if a kidney stone passes by it can damage this epithelium and then you can have hematuria or the presence of blood in urine. This is a longitudinal section of the ureter to show you this transitional epithelium. So these cells are tall 
when the epithelium, uh, uh, sorry, when the ureter is empty, and then they can be squished when the ureter is passing the urine. So for the urinary bladder, so it's the muscular sac that uh, stores the urine. It's located on the floor of the pelvic cavity, and it's located posterior to the pubic symphysis, and it's found inferiorly to the peritoneum. The, walls of the, the wall of the urinary bladder is made out of three layers. So the outer layer that it is covered by parietal peritoneum is made out of connective tissue and superiorly is where it has the peritoneum and it, it is covered by adventitia elsewhere. The middle layer is also known as the trusor muscle it has these three layers of smooth muscle cell or muscularis. And internally to these muscularis, we have the transitional epithelium, which is similar to the epithelium that we have in the ureter. So in there, we have these tall cells that become squished when uh, the urinary bladder is, in, is full. And within the mucosa, we can see foldings of tissue, which we call rugae or wrinkles that are conspicuous or really visible when the urinary uh, bladder is empty. At the entry of the ureters into the urinary bladder, inside we have a, a smooth portion of the mucosa, which is called the trigon. So the trigon is the part of the, ure uh, of the urinary bladder where you have the entry of the ureters and the opening for the urethra. The urinary bladder can hold up to 800 milliliters of, uh, milliliters of urine, but it has an average of 500 milliliters in the adult. It's highly distensible, and as it's filled, uh, expands superiorly and the rugae will flatten, and the epithelium will thin from five or six layers to two to three. So this is a longitudinal section or frontal section of the urinary bladder. So you can see here how the ureters are uh, entering, entering posteriorly. These are the different layers, so this is the uh, peritoneum superiorly and elsewhere will be adventitia. This will be the detrusor muscle made of smooth muscle cells. And then this is the mucosa and you can see these foldings, which will be the rugae. In this case, because the urinary bladder is empty. And then here is the trigon. So the ureters enter posteriorly at the base of the urinary bladder. This is the neck of the urinary bladder where the ureter starts, the opening of the ureter starts. So the space between the two openings for the ureters and the opening for the urethra is called the trigon. This is an area uh, where you have a very smooth mucosa. Why? Because you have the constant uh, flow of urine in here. And this is one of the regions where people uh, can develop more likely cancer because uh, just by gravity, the urine tends to go here. And remember, since the urine has a lot of these toxic wastes like urea, uric acid, etc., all these toxic wastes are in close contact with the mucosa and then that can damage the cells and can transform it into cancerous cells. And then uh, we have an sphincter in here that it is not shown, it is not labeled, but this is the internal urethral sphincter, which is made out of smooth muscle cells. So this will close uh, to allow the urinary bladder to be filled with uh, urine. And then in here, uh, the last portion of the urethra, which is this, we have the external urethral sphincter, which is made out of skeletal muscle cells. So this one, we can control voluntarily because it's made out of skeletal muscle cells. And this, the internal urethral sphincter, we cannot control it voluntarily because it's made out of smooth muscle cells. So this is the 
longitudinal section of the tissue of the urinary bladder so you can see the different layers so this is the transitional epithelium this is the the trusor muscle and this region will be called the sub submucosa and this will be the lamina propria that holds this transitional epithelium so again this is the transitional epithelium of the urinary bladder submucosa in here and this is the the truso muscle great magnification here of the transitional epithelium so if you see these cells are very tall just because this urinary bladder is empty and these foldings will represent the rugae and this is the lamina propria So now let's talk about the urethra. So the urethra will be the tube that conveys the urine out of the body. In females, the urethra is short. It measures uh, between three to four centimeters in length, so less than two inches. And this one is bound to the anterior wall of the vagina. The external urethral orifice, it will be located between the vagina and the vaginal orifice and the clitoris in females. Now in the males, the urethra is long and the external urethral sphincter is located where the urethra passes through the pelvic floor and a skeletal muscle will be found here in this external urethral sphincter to control the exit of the urine. So this is the urethra in females, it's very short. And then in here we have the external urethral sphincter. In males, it's very long, as I said before, it has 18 centimeters in length. And it has, uh, it's subdivided into three regions, prostatic, membranous, and spongy or penile. The prostatic urethra measures one uh, inch in length. And it's called prostatic urethra because it passes through the, uh, through the prostate gland. The membranous urethra is the short, shortest part of the urethra. It measures 0.5 centimeters and it passes through the pelvic floor. Now the spongy or penal urethra, it measures 15 centimeters in length or six inches passes throughout the penis in the corpus spongiosum. And the internal urethral sphincter is the detrusor muscle thickening, and the external urethral sphincter is made of skeletal muscle of the pelvic floor. So this is the urethra in males. It's very long, and it has these regions, the prostatic urethra that passes through this organ which is the prostate gland and then this will be the membranous urethra that passes through this pelvic floor made out of the ure urogenital diaphragm or these muscles and then this will be the spongy urethra or penile urethra. This is the longest part and it passes through this uh, spongy body or uh, spongiosum body from the male penis which is this. And then in here we have the external urethral orifice and in here we have the external urethral sphincter and then in here we have the internal urethral sphincter. The external urethral orifice has this uh, dilation to allow the uh, passing of more urine into the glands of the penis which is this. So this concludes this video lecture. Uh, feel free to email me any questions and for some of you have a good day or have a good night bye bye